Good afternoon. How is everybody today? A little warmer in here, I guess, but uh, but uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's supposed to go up in the 40s tomorrow. 50 by Friday, I guess, from what I understand. Eh, eh, well, yeah, whatever is right. Weather's weather. Take you take it as it comes. Anyway, today is the. Uh, start of uh, another four talk set. And this one kind of, uh, I guess you could say, uh, except for today, because we're just going into Stalin's background here. Uh, this is kind of a, a continuation of the Russian Revolution from the fall, I guess, if you want to call it that. Uh, because starting next week, we'll get into how, really get into Stalin's revolution at that point. Uh, how he begins to really take control of this thing known as Russia, Russia, and and the you know many I always tell people you know, when you talk about World War II, many people seem enamored with Hitler. Doesn't Hitler get a lot of press? Yeah, he sure does. But you know I always tell people it's it that's fine understanding Hitler. It's important, uh, but boy, you're missing something if you don't get into Stalin. He really is a fascinating character, and he's not, uh, he's not an unsophisticated rust, as not as much of an unsophisticated rustic as maybe some people would like to think. And he's really not uh, a, re a buffoon as a theorist. I mean, there is something going on here. There really is. Uh, in fact, at one point, he's a, although right almost from the get-go here, uh, where Lenin uh, in 1906, 1907, would like to see perhaps uh, the Bolshevik representatives elected to the Duma, the Russian parliament, Stalin really at this point, even at this early stage, pa uh, parliamentary government, nah, <laughs> not interested, not interested. And so you, 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 see begin, you, know, you see differences of opinion here, even with Lenin, although he understands one thing, he's going to tie his fortunes to Lenin. Of course, that's going to help him win out in the end. But he is born in Gori in Georgia. He is a Georgian on December 18, 1878, to a Bessarian Yugoslavia and, and a Katerina Yugoslavia, uh, Jabladza. And Stalin really, uh, his, na his name really is, uh, is Yugoslavia. And his father is a uh, cobbler, shoemaker. And for a while he has a, he has a decent business going, but after a while the business begins to do this, and the, the family falls from the working class into abject poverty. And so, you know, many of these revolutionaries who fought, you know, who appear in history, weren't many of them middle class? Not Stalin. Working class eventually falls into the poor. In fact, the, the, the family becomes so poor that in a period of 10 years, they live in nine rented rooms. You know, moving from room to room to room. Now, what's interesting about this family, even, even though, even though uh, him, his mother and father have him on December 18, 1878, the mother, mother and father, uh, 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 Bessarian uh, Yugoslavia and his wife, uh, Katerina, were actually married in May 1872. They had two boys before Joseph. Both died in infancy. In this respect, Stalin has some sort of commonality here with Vladimir Putin. Putin's parents had him late in life. They were well into their 40s in 1952. Putin actually had two older brothers. He'll never meet them, which is why when I give a talk on, on Vladimir Putin, I always say Putin was the, th was the third of three boys, but he, but he was the only child. And you get these looks like, oh, what is that supposed to mean? Well, it's the same thing with Stalin. Stalin is the third of three boys, but he's an only child. Why? Because his brothers died before he'll ever know them. Same thing with Vladimir Putin. And so, Mr. St the, the, you know, as the family degenerates into poverty here, uh, Bessarian, the father, 
uh, actually is an alcoholic. And he's not a peaceful alcoholic. You know, he beats his wife, he beats young Joseph. In fact, in this respect, Joe Stalin shares something with Saddam Hussein. His stepfather, his, his father died, but his stepfather, uh, who his mother has to marry because you know, they need, need to be supported here, uh, beats young Saddam with a stick encrusted with asphalt. Now, how do you think that boy's going to turn out? Yeah, by the, time, by the time young Saddam is like 18, 19, he's already killed four times. And so, you know, Mr. Stalin's going to follow the same route. And that's interesting, too, because Saddam, one of Saddam's political idols was who? Joseph Stalin. Fascinating. And yet, uh, Katerina does not want her son to be brought up like this. She leaves, winds up at the home of a family friend, a cleric, Christopher Charkviviani. And he, he is a cleric, and he takes them in. She begins to try to make ends meet by cleaning houses, taking in laundry, this kind of thing. And she wants young Joseph to go to school. She wants him to be educated, which would be a break because no one in the family was educated. Winds up going to a school in Gori. He's actually uh, fairly talented. And as a young boy is writing, write, writes poetry, interested in art, drama class, very intel fairly intelligent individual. Yet Joseph still has, being how he's brought up, that violent streak to him in fights, so to speak. And keep in mind, too, health-wise, uh, he had a... Um, one minor, well, I'll call it a minor problem, I guess, in comparison to some problems that afflict people. He had small pox, which uh, counts for the pockmarked face. But he was also, uh, had an accident, and his left arm, if you've ever seen, seen pictures of Stalin, that left arm is kind of held like this, and never healed properly. So that'll be a physical ailment, but it won't stop him, let's put it that way. It won't stop him. He is held in such esteem where there are clerics who believe that he should go on to school. He will be sent, by the time he's 16, to the, Tif to the, uh, in Tif the Tiflis Spiritual Seminary in Tiflis in, in, in Georgia. This is usually reserved for, for the children of clerics, yet... Uh, Father uh, Vivani will make sure that he gets into the school with 600 others who are looking to be priests. Now, in the beginning here, young Joseph, who's 16 at the time, uh, again, a talented student, write, again writing poetry here. You know, he had five poems published? Wow. Yeah. But also something else begins to develop here, too. You know, he's getting older. He's beginning to develop his own mind. Don't we all go through this? We're looking to experiment, right? We're looking to pursue different avenues. His revolutionary politics. And it's not long before he begins to demonstrate a streak where some clerics are beginning to say he's even... Uh, he's even becoming an atheist. He begins to read. Revol In fact, it's to the point where he's not going to begin doffing his cap when a cleric walks into a room. He's beginning to read certain books like Das Kapital, The Communist Manifesto. Marx, Marxian politics is actually beginning to, we'll say, take off here in Georgia. Now keep in mind, this is, this is, still, this is still Tsarist Russia. You know, and you're getting to that point, you're closing in on the 20th century. Now you're getting to that point, too, where uh, you know, Tsar, uh, the, the Romanovs are beginning to lose their allure. You know, and by the end of the 19th century, 
the ideas of the French Revolution, these ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, socialism, parliamentarianism, are beginning to really, really find their way through Europe and eventually into Russia. Even though Russia, at this point of the, of the major powers, is not as industrialized, not as advanced. And again, Mr. Stalin is going to change that, and we'll get into that more next week. And that, I find that absolutely fascinating. But, you know, Joe Stalin actually gravitates to certain novels, too. Like a Nikolai Chernievsky, who wrote a book called What is to be Done? in 1863. It's a novel. It's a pro-revolutionary novel. He gravitates to this book. And Alexander Kazbagi wrote a book called The Patricide. And Stalin even takes the nickname of one of the characters out of this novel called Koba. The guy is a, the guy is a bank robber or a robber, which Stalin is going to become robbing banks and so on and so forth for the Bolsheviks. And so by the time he's 19, he joins the, he joins the Georgian Socialist Party, which is based off Marxism. And he begins to become a party organizer. Organizing, and this is like, but this is by 1899, and so he becomes a party organizer, to the point that by 1901, you know, he's organized demonstrations, so on and so forth, work action, so on and so forth, and so by 1901, the Okhrana, which is the which is the Tsar's secret police, uh, they begin to know who he is. And so Stalin sometimes is going to have to be on the run, so to speak. Although keep in mind, by 1903 he will be arrested. 1902 he'll be arrested. 1903 he'll be sent to Siberia, one of six exiles to Siberia. And every time he's exiled, he always makes his way back west into Russia, into, in, you know, in, into the western part of Russia, going back to Georgia or Saint Petersburg, which is later going to be changed to Petrograd because the Russians thought St. Petersburg sounded too German. And then that's later going to be changed to Leningrad. Now what's it called? St. Petersburg, right. Now we're back to that. No. And so Stalin is beginning to make his name felt. He's beginning to make his name, you know, he's beginning to make a mark for himself here. In 1901, he will, be, he will be allowed to join the, the Georgian faction of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. This is a party that comes out of, of, Mar, of, 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 of the Marxist persuasion. Georgi Plekhanov, one of the leading Marxist doctrinaires of Russia. But of course, there's another young man involved in this party too. His name is... Vladimir Lenin. And while, and while uh, uh, Stalin in 1903 is consigned to his first exile in Siberia, you begin to see a split developing in the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party. Julia, a man by the name of Julius Martov and his Mensheviks and Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks. And when, Lenin, when Stalin makes his escape from, from Siberia and makes his, May West, way, his, his way west back to Georgia, he will become one of the leading Bolsheviks in Georgia. He gravitates to that, to that persuasion, which the Mensheviks are known as the, in, the, in that, in that Russian Social Democratic uh, Labor Party as the majority, the Bolsheviks are the minority. 
and Lenin's going to Lenin's going to move to that position known as the violent overthrow of the established order uh, based off Marx. If you've read the Communist Manifesto, you know Marx was more of a scientific socialist as a as opposed to these so-called utopian socialists who believed, you know, um, you know, assimilating socialism into into the current system as opposed to Marx who didn't believe that stuff. No, nah, we need we need a more realistic approach. If you want to take power, it's the violent overthrow of the established order end of discussion. And a dictatorship of the proletariat. And so there's all these ideas being thrown around here. Stalin will finally meet Lenin in 1905 Supposedly a meeting in St. Petersburg, but that was changed when he gets there to the Duchy of Finland. Keep in mind, Finland was still part of Russia. And so here, Lenin meets, um, Stalin meets Lenin. And, and Stalin really is taken by Lenin, but they don't quite agree on one thing. They don't agree on, quite, on one thing. Lenin believes in trying to have maybe Bolshevik candidates try to get elected to the Duma. Stalin doesn't believe in that. Stalin has, no, Stalin has no interest in parliamentary politics. That kind of shows you what Stalin, where Stalin is going with his political beliefs. In 1906, he, all, he also he marries, by the way, Ekaterina Spianadnidze. She will be dead from typhus in 1907 but not before she bores a child named Yakov. And that will be the oldest son Stalin will have. And after his wife dies in 1907, he drops Yakov off with her family so he can continue on with his party activities. Also, he has a bank rob, he has a bank rob, it's almost like the hole in, hole in the wall gang. It's known as the outfit. And they, and they indulge in bank robberies uh, to raise money for the Bolsheviks. And that's another thing. When, when, when the, the Fourth Party Congress in Stockholm in 1906, I believe, 1906, uh, it's, this is the first time Stalin's out of the country. And the majority Mensheviks do not like the idea of raising party funds through bank robberies. Lenin, Stalin, looking to hitch his wagon to Lenin, backs up Lenin. No, we ought to have bank robberies to raise money. And it's not just bank robberies Stalin's engaged in. How about kidnapping children from the rich families? Ransom? How about that? Counterfeiting? Yeah. And so Stalin's looking anyway to raise money for the party. And this, you know, this, this raises Lenin's stature within the party. Raises his stature within the party. And, but again, you know, he, he's also uh, going to be an editor for a, ma for a newspaper that's eventually going to come out called Pravda. He will be one of the editors of this, of this newspaper. But keep in mind, between 1906, 1907, up to 1917, he's in and out of Siberia like six times. But he's, also, but he's very deeply involved in this point in Bolshevik activities. Again, robbing, kidnapping, kidna or sometimes kidnapping uh, children from the rich, holding them out for ransom. He was also involved in the, the 1905 revolution. Now here is where Father Gapon, uh, up in St. Petersburg, with an entourage of 200, 300,000 people, depending on which source you consult, presented a petition to the Tsar. They wanted a better deal. They didn't want to overthrow the Tsar, but they do want a better deal. Greater ownership to land. Keep in mind the landed gentry. Here we are with this again. I've said this in, in previous talks. Too much land and too few hands helps to lead to a revolution. 
I suggest you keep that in mind when you go back and review the 2008 mortgage crisis in this country. Isn't it what John Adams stated? You want a functioning system of representative government, the wide ownership of land has to be. That's John Adams. That's John Adams. Many of you people probably understand this. Don't you have a home? You don't have to be a huge landowner. But, give it, but owning land does give, you, does give you a piece of the action. Skin in the game, as the saying goes. Doesn't that, you pay the taxes on that land, right, in that house. Doesn't that give you the right to go down to the common council meeting if you want to go there and vent your spleen if you don't like what they're doing? Of course it does. But in places like Russia, where too much land is in too few hands, what rights do the people have? They don't have any rights. Again, look at some of these revolutions. Your own as an example. One of the major reasons you have a revolution here is because the crown told the colonists you can't have land. Really? Russian Revolution. Peasants took the land. French Revolution. The Vietnamese Revolution. Chinese Revolution. Heck, even Castro was given land to the peasants. Even Kim Il-sung in North Korea understood that one. Believe it or not. Interesting what you see here. And so what is the Tsar's answer to this petition? Again, these people, Father Gapon leading this entourage, they don't want to take the Tsar out. How about a constitutional monarchy? How about that? No. So instead of talking to the people, he sicks the Cossacks on them. Again, depending on which source you'll read, it's two to 3,000 people killed or wounded. Men, women, children, young, old, made no difference. Yet he will acquiesce, and ha the Tsar will acquiesce and have a Duma or a parliament. But again, who's going to control the parliament? The privilege set in the end. And within a couple year or two, the parliament would become a rubber stamp. So where did the people advance? Not that much. Not that much at all. And so does this help inflame this, re this revolutionary politics? Yes. But again, Stalin is rising, raising his fortunes through, through, the, through, the, through this lead up to the First World War. Now keep in mind, at, at this point, by 1912, 1914, you know, Stalin is, 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 uh, is the editor of Pravda, He's also going to be picked up again for his last time and sent to, to Siberia. And when the war starts, 1914, that's where he is. Keep in mind, in 1916, you know, uh, you know Russia's, Russia's, Russia's star is falling at this point. They even go to Siberia. They want men for the Russian army. They're even willing to take the prisoners or those exiled in Siberia and put them in the Russian army. Well, a doctor takes a look at Stalin, takes a look at that arm. Hey, he's not going to work. So he won't be involved in the fighting. However, in February of 1917, when the revolution starts, what about these guys in Siberia? And keep in mind, at one point, he's shacked up with Yakov Sverdlov, another Bolshevik, in Siberia. However, when the revolution starts, how are you going to keep some of these people in Siberia? He takes the train ride west. And in March, he's in, Stalin is in St. Petersburg. Him and Lev Kamenev, Another important Bolshevik here will co-edit Pravda at this point. And you're, seeing, and you're seeing at this point, you're seeing here the new provisional government take control as well as the Petrograd Soviet. Now the provisional government, which is looking to fill that void left by the Tsar, who abdicates, he has no choice at this stage of the game. And Lenin's not even in the country at this point. But the provisional government is made up of different factions. Those who support the monarchy. Those who support the military. There are some moderates, some socialists. 
business, banks, so on and so forth. The Petrograd Soviet is made up predominantly of workers, soldiers, and peasants. And they're both vying for control. Now, the soldiers are interesting because after that huge offensive in 1916, which is actually marks the end of Russia as a power here, or the Tsarist Zar Russia as a power, I mean, keep in mind 1916 is an important year. Why? Because of the battles of Verdun and the Somme on the Western Front. The Germans were looking to knock the French out of the war here in 19, February 1916. February 21, 1916 is when that battle starts. In fact, the artillery barrage was of such virulence that in less than 10 hours, the Germans dropped 1 million artillery rounds on the French lines. In fact, some military historians um, estimate that in that 10, month ba 10 months that battle raged at the cost of three quarters of a million Germans and Frenchmen, dead, wounded, missing, God knows where they are. Some military historians estimate that 30 to 40 million artillery rounds were fired during that battle by both sides here. In fact, I have a book written on the Somme River and another military historian estimates that 1,350,000 tons of artillery steel became part of the earth. Boy, talk about climate change. Wow. Send that one to the White House. And yet the French want help. The British launch an attack to the north on the trench line, the Somme River, July 1st, 1916. And it doesn't work. The British lo lose 60,000 men in one day. Killed, wounded, missing, whatever. That is the worst re day of loss in the history of Brit the British Army. The worst. Please, right, Russia, please launch an assault on the Eastern Front. You've got to take the pressure off. And so the Russians will do this. They will launch an offensive in the summer of 1916 on the southern part of the Eastern Front and attack the Austro-Hungarian Empire, try to get through the Carpathians and into the Austro-Hungarian plain and knock Austria-Hungary out of the war. The Germans are going to have to send troops from the Western Front to the Eastern Front. They will do this. They have to. They have to shore up their client state or their ally, let's put it, let's put it what they're supposed to be anyway. And the Russians will inflict 600,000 casualties in the Austro-Hungarian army in the summer of 1916. They only mobilize like less than 300,000 men for the war. That's all they can mobilize. 600,000 in the summer. The Austro-Hungarian army's crippled. They're crippled. Yet, that offensive in 1916 cost the Russians a million men. Dead, wounded, prisoners, who knows? And, you know, and what is the Russian peasant getting out of this? What are they getting out of this? Zippo. You know what happens? Some of these guys either drop their rifles or shoulder them and start walking home. We're done. We're out of here. And so when people don't want to fight, when they don't want to fight anymore, and that leads to what? Well, Rasputin's going to be killed in December 1916 by members of the royal family, but it's too late by then. It's, they're done. They're finished. And in February 1917, that's when the revolution starts in St. Petersburg. Soldiers, workers, and peasants in the surrounding countryside. They've had enough. They've had enough. And so Stalin now can make his way back from Siberia. And him and Lev Kamenev will be able to start editing Pravda again. They got to keep this going. Keep the fireworks going with the printed word. And so again, you see, as the, as the Tsar abdicates, 
with this growing revolution, you see a provisional government formed uh, and also the, um, the Petrograd Soviet. And that's the important one here in the end, really. Workers, soldiers, and peasants. The Bolsheviks, they're part of the Petrograd Soviet. Mensheviks, social revolutionaries. The social revolutionaries are a peasant party. Now that's important because Lenin said years before, you know, going back to this idea of a proletarian revolution. The Marxian idea, proletarian revolution, the factory worker. Well, isn't Russia at this point, you know, they're not as industrialized as Western Europe. But Lenin, sta uh, Lenin states that yes, this idea of a proletarian revolution has to be mated with the peasant. Because the peasant is what? 90% of the Russian population. That's why. Yes? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. I mean, some people who can read are going to start spouting these ideas. I mean, isn't, isn't that what common sense was? here in 1776, although don't knock some of these colonists, some of these colonists could read here. No, but the basic idea is the same. You get a revolutionary like Thomas Paine coming out with something like common sense and he's lambasting Christianity. Read that book and yet it's still the second most popular piece of literature in the colonies here in 1776. Oh, of course, because you're, you're the, it's, the, it's the written word. Of course, people like Hitler say it's the spoken word. But the written word helps. And so something like a Pravda is necessary here to put forth the ideas in print. And Stalin will do this. And again, there's more going on here with Stalin than, you know, than him being considered a rustic buffoon. That's not the case. If he was a rustic buffoon, would he have gotten as far as he did? I don't think so. And so here, but here you see, you know, Lenin is going to begin calling it even in April and May, a violent overthrow of the established order. And so where at one point here, you're, you're, again, you're seeing where the, where the provisional government, interesting how the parting of the waves is developing here. The provisional government wants to keep Russia in the war. The Petrograd Soviet even, 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 even puts out orders. Look to the army, the soldiers. If the provisional government wants you to keep order, fine. If they're going to order you to the front to fight the Germans, disobey the orders. Disobey them. Is there going to be a crackdown by the provisional government on, on, the, on the Petrograd Soviet? Yeah, they're going to try to close down Pravda. You know, Lenin's going to get into Russia, but then again, he's going to have to back out into Finland again so he does not capture it. In fact, at one point, you get into July, the July days where the, where, the, where the provisional government really cracks down on the Bolsheviks, Stalin's going to have to help Lenin escape. Of course, does that increase Stalin's value to Lenin? Yeah, of course it does. Of course it does. And so, but by, but by you know, you get to October where, yes, you know, the, in, in the summer of 1917, when the provisional government tried to launch an offensive with the Russian army again ag against the Germans. Why? Because the Allies want Russia to stay in the war. To keep German troops on the Eastern Front. But again, when, uh, by Kare Alexander Kerensky is in charge of the provisional government, a socialist. He wants to keep Russia in the war. Of course, Russia gets trade, credit, so on and so forth from the West. Let's understand that. But again, when he goes to launch an offensive, it falls apart. Again, these same Russian troops don't want to fight. They're done. They're finished. And there'll be one last gasp effort where the, where the provisional government will try to crack down on the Petrograd Soviet. In the end, it's going to fail. And so in October of 1917, when Lenin called, and there were some Bolsheviks who didn't want to go along with this. Don't throw yourselves with the Mensheviks. Throw off the provisional government and let's take power. Stalin's for this. 
Trotsky is for this at this stage of the game. And sure enough, they will take power November 1917. And guess who's going? They're going to be the top four of the Bolshevik. And Lenin's going to create another government here, the Subnarkom, which is going to be the People's Commissariat, the People's Committee, the Commissariat. And guess who are going to be the top four here? Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, Yakov Sverdlov, and guess who else? Joseph Stalin. Now, some, now Trotsky will later say, well, Stalin really didn't do much uh, when the Bolsheviks took power. Hogwash, he's on the executive committee, and he was, and he was the editor, helped one of the editors of Pravda. He did do something during, this, during, this, during the revolution. However, keep in mind, when Lenin wants to have, bring up the Cheka, which will be the Soviet, which will be the, uh, the Bolshevik secret police, Lenin is for it. I mean, Stalin is for it. There were some who weren't, because they thought it would turn the people off. Well, once you take power in a situation like this, don't you have to put down any, anybody who's going to be a potential threat here? And so as they're forming this, this co new coalition government, the Mensheviks will be ostracized. The extreme of the social revolutionaries will be allowed into this coalition government. Why? Because, again, go back to what Lenin stated earlier, that, yes, the proletariat needs to, needs to, act, needs to, co needs to be with the peasant. Because why? The peasants are 90% of the people. And keep in mind, Lenin wants to nationalize the land, but he can't. Why? Because the peasants are taking the land. And Stalin understands this, too. You know, it's going to be kind of hard to tell millions of people who have been, who've had this pent-up energy for 300 years because of the Romanovs, who never really owned the land they were digging in, now you're going to tell them they can't have the land? I don't think that's going to happen. Especially when the peasants are taking it upon themselves. They're not waiting for the provisional government. They're not waiting for the Petrograd Soviet. They're in the countryside taking the land, burning down the palaces, and in some respects killing the landed gentry. And then just taking the land and dividing it up. You're going to tell them no? I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that's going to work at all. Lenin, meanwhile, is cracking down on political opponents. Stalin at the same time, who is, and Lenin sees Stalin as an expert on the nationalities in Russia. Stalin believes that the nationalities in Russia should be allowed autonomy. Get a load of that one. Get a load of that one. Lenin is on the same page here because they think you can, offer the, you can offer the nationalities autonomy, but with an, a Soviet republic. We'll offer them uh, autonomy, but we really won't give it to them. You know how that goes. We really won't give it to them. Yet at the same time here, at the same time, the social revolutionaries you know, these, these really extreme leftist social revolutionaries, the party, the real party of the, of the, of the peasant, there are some who, don't, who believe that what, the, so, that what the, the Bolsheviks are proposing here is really smoke and mirrors. That they really don't care about the autonomy of these nationalities. What they really want to build is a, is, an, is a government of centralized control to keep these people in the fold. And that's exactly what they want to do. That's exactly what they want to do. And so at the same time here, the end of 1917 getting into 1918, the Germans are pressing their case here for Ukraine. Keep in mind the British blockade is biting and biting hard. And so the, Brit the Germans want, would want nothing better than to turn the turn of Ukraine into, into a Teutonic delicatessen. They got to feed their people. 
they got to feed them. And so Lenin will sign off, Lenin will, Lenin and them will sign off on a deal where the Russian, the Germans will get a lot of Western Russia. They have no choice. They have no choice. Stalin will back this. Again, throwing his lot with Lenin. He will back this. There are some Bolsheviks who won't. But it doesn't make any difference. Lenin's going to order Trotsky. You know, Trotsky was the negotiator. And as, and, as, and as talented as Trotsky was, he couldn't stop the Germans. And so when they give away Ukraine and large parts of Western Russia, this is going to cause a split within that coalition between the Bolsheviks and the social revolutionaries, and that's going to help launch the Civil War. Yes? Ah, the, the peasants are just grabbing the land. They're just grabbing it. They did the same thing during the French Revolution. A gun comes in handy. You know, uh, you know, uh, possession is 99% of the law. I mean, you can sit down and talk all you want, but when somebody grabs something, they own it. Isn't that how basically how it works? Isn't that what history teaches us? Basically, yeah, that seems to work. You know, I mean, uh, actually, one example. Go back to the Balfour Declaration. What does it say in the Balfour Declaration? Yeah, sure, Jewish people can live here as, as long as the people who originally lived here don't, don't really, you know, aren't really going to be pushed out of that territory. That's basically what this says. Uh, what's going on now? What happened to the Indian here? All those treaties with the Indian, remember those? What happened to that one? You know, uh, you know man always takes from his fellow man. That's basically how it works. And that's, not, that's no different what's happening here. And in fact, in fact, people like Lenin understood that, yes, uh, we have to throw our lot with the peasant, in other words, this proletarian revolution, because we have no choice. He's taking Marxism and acclimating it to the situation that is as it exists in Russia. And Stalin understands this. However, Stalin, when the Civil War starts, is an interesting character. The Bolshevik, you know, and again, many of these peasants uh, many of these peasants, they don't trust the Bolsheviks, but they'll throw their lot with the Bolsheviks. They know with the white armies, which is made up really, who commands the white armies? The military, the monarchists, business pipes, bankers, maybe some moderates, but the, they know they're not going to get the land with that group. So why would they want to fight with the, with, with the white armies for? They will throw their, most of the peasants will throw their lot with the Bolsheviks. Why? Because at least there's a chance of keeping the land that we've grabbed. But Lenin was smart in the beginning here. You know, as, as this Brest-Litovsk deal was being signed, giving a lot of Western Russia over to the Germans, Lenin moved the capital from, from Petrograd to Moscow, March 1918. That was smart because now the Bolsheviks have central control in the middle of Russia. You know, the Germans have parts of Russia, but of course, by, by, by Armistice Day 1918, what happened to the Germans? They fell apart. But who's going to fill that void? The white armies. In the west, white armies in the east. The Bolsheviks are in the middle, hence the Civil War. Now, Stalin, Stalin, and they need food, by the way. The Bolshevik, the Reds need food. And so they are going to start what's going to be known as war communism. They're going to have to procure food from the peasants that are supposedly fought with them. Now some of these peasants aren't going to like that. You know, you get these, you get these Bolshevik, uh, you know, uh, 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 guys coming in and taking certain amount of grain and livestock to feed the army. You have to do this. Army has to eat, right? Some of you guys were in the army. What is it they used to say? An army is what an army eats? travels on its stomach. And so Stalin is going to be a, Stalin is going to be doing what the Confederates were doing down south. You had you had those you had those you had 
you had representatives from the Confederate government going to the small farmers and taking a certain percentage of grain from Confederate farmers and livestock to feed that Confederate army. What are you going to tax the people and buy the food? What was a Confederate dollar worth? So we'll just grab the, we'll grab the food and grab the livestock that we need. Well, that's what the Bolsheviks are doing. But then again, the whites are doing the same thing. But Stalin carries this further. He gets to, to, he gets to Tsaritsyn, which is later going to be Stalingrad. He gets to Tsaritsyn in the southern part of Russia, and he's leading the effort to get food. And it's not just that. It's not just that. He gets involved in leading military operations. And he will throw his lot with a Semyon Budeni and a Clemente Voroshilov, who will later, you're going to hear those two names again, because they're going to fit into the Stalinist regime. And in fact, at one point, he tries to oversee a military effort, and a lot of Bolshevik, a lot of Red soldiers are killed against fighting against the whites, which does not set well with Lenin. But at the same time, he's, his job of procuring food for the Red Army, he takes it a step further. There are some villages who will, don't quite see eye to eye with this policy. He burns them down. You know, there are some in the Bolshevik party who feel that's pushing the envelope here. There are other people he's going to have shot. Again, go back to what I mentioned before. Stalin and parliamentary politics? I don't think so. I don't think so. In fact, he will be sent to Petrograd after this. He will be sent to Petrograd. The th a, thir the, a group, an outfit known as the 3rd Regiment defected from the Red Army to the Reds. And what does Stalin do? As representative, Lenin's representatives, well, whoever he, can't, whoever he can capture has them shot. This gives you an idea of what Russia can expect down the road. When the Civil War is over, 1920, there is still the problem with Poland, a newly minted Poland here. Poland's going to invade. You know, there, there has been fighting between the newly minted Polish army and Red, and Red Army troops until finally fighting breaks out, really breaks out in 1920, the Polish invasion of Russia. And the Red Army, Trotsky runs this, he's the commissar of the Red Army, is going to try to stop this invasion. And keep in mind, as the Poles are advancing east into Ukraine, here we go again, Ukraine. They're slaughtering Jewish people by the bushel, the pogroms. But they're going to be stopped just short of Kiev. Trotsky, again, commissar of the Red Army. And they'll throw the Poles back. Now, there are some Bolsheviks, Lenin too was, was, was part of this, who believed that once the Red Army got into Poland, the Polish working class will join the Reds. You know who didn't think that was going to happen? Stalin. He didn't think so. And who's going to be right about that one? Stalin, because as Red Army troops get into Poland, they rally to Joseph Pilsudski, and they'll throw the Russians back. And the war will be over 1921, because both sides are going to be exhausted anyway. And the po a Polish border will be arranged, and that'll be the end of that. Of course, that's only going to be temporary, because what's going to happen in 1939? Poland will be wiped off the map by Hitler with Stalin's connivance. And Stalin will get back the territory they lost. No. But when this war is finally over with, Mr. Stalin's position in the Bolshevik party is virtually assured at this point. Keep in mind in 1921, St uh, Lenin, you know, he, there's gonna, they're having problems here in Russia. You know, the civil war is over with, but at the same time, what's happened to the Russian economy? Yeah, that's right, it's going down. You're right, it's going down. And so even members of the proletariat are beginning to revolt against the Bolsheviks. Lenin's going to have to, Lenin's going to, have to make peace here. The new economic policy 
adopting capitalist methods into the Soviet economy. Trotsky's not a big fan of this. Stalin goes along again with Lenin. We want to stay in power? Then maybe the peasant has to, has to make more money selling what he's growing. You know, and let's stop taking the let's stop taking the grain and the livestock from the peasant. 1922. Lenin has a massive stroke. And guess who's at his beck and call? Stalin. Stalin attains the position, general secretary of the party. This is a lot of power for Stalin. Because as general secretary of the party, he oversees all the other secretariats. And guess what's going to happen here? What do you think Stalin is doing? Inserting people in the various portfolios of this, of the, of this burgeoning Soviet government? Yes. He's a great backroom politician. He's a great backroom politician. And of course, 19, into 1922, getting into 1923, you know, even Lenin at one point is going to see that Stalin is accumulating a lot of power. And of course, in 1924, January, when Lenin dies, you know, Lenin was not big into the cult of the personality. In fact, some of these Bolsheviks used to laugh at the fascists in Italy. Mussolini, you know, with the little fez and the tassel and these black uniforms and these, and, you know, Bolsheviks used to say, this is, a, this is, this is a, it's comical. And yet, when Lenin dies, Stalin is the one who's going to help organize the funeral and be one of the pallbearers. The cult of Leninism begins when Lenin dies. And who helps to foster that? Joe Stalin. Why? Because to do that, he has to have this cult of Stalin to project himself as Lenin's, Lenin's heir. Yeah. And so it's interesting how the dead can be even more powerful than when they're alive. Courtesy of certain people, perhaps. And so what you begin to see here is Trotsky. Trotsky is one of those who doesn't want Stalin to take power. He's actually leading this thing known as the left opposition. Stalin, Trotsky wanted to get, a, get rid of labor unions. Lenin was against this. And guess who's going to support Lenin? Stalin. And so, and so this left opposition, and Stalin is considered, get this, part of the right opposition with people like Lev Kamenev and also um, Grigory Zinoviev, who was always a high-ranking Bolshevik. Yet Zinoviev is interesting because Zinoviev opposes Trotsky but is wary of Stalin's power, growing power. And so by 1925, 1926, you know, Stalin begins to, followers that are in the Soviet government of Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev, he begins to purge them, inserting his own people. And so Lev Kamenev and Grigory Zinoviev are going to leave Stalin, and guess who they're going to go with? Trotsky. Is it going to, and Nikolai Bukharin, who was really one of the party theorists, is in the Stalin camp at this point. Though even he has um, reservations, but you know, Stalin has the whip hand. And so really at this point, who's really running Russia? Uncle Joe. And so by 1926, 27, the Party Congress uh, 
Grigory Zinoviev and Lev Kamenev are one of are two of those people that are going to have to get back in Stalin's good graces because they've been purged from from actual positions of government. And Trotsky, on the other hand, will be kicked out of the party and sent into exile. And by 1929, he'll be given his train tickets and he's on his way to Turkey. And so Stalin truly takes control of this country. He truly takes control of this country. And so the course of what's going to be called the Soviet Union is going to change here. Yes? Stalin was 73 when he died. So when was 1924. 50. 15, 15, 15, 15, 15. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, approximately. He was 50, 54, 55, I think, when he died. Stop, oh, Lenin. Right. Well, Stalin's Stalin's older than that. He'll be he'll be he'll be fifty years old uh, in nineteen in nineteen thirty four. Right. Right. Or fi no fifty three in nineteen fifty three I think in nineteen fifty fifty three fifty four in nineteen thirty four. Well, yeah. Well, you can call him an apprentice. But he's patting his own, he's patting his own, he's feathering his own nest. Just like Saddam will do when the Ba'athist party takes control in Iraq in 1968. You know, uh, 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 Hassan Bakir runs the country, but guess who's doing a lot of the legwork for him? Saddam. And so what is Saddam doing? Sure, he'll stay with Hassan Bakir, but guess what Saddam is doing after 1968? He's bringing up people who are going to be allied to who? To him. And so when Hassan Bakir calls it quits in 1979, guess who's going to step right in? Saddam Hussein. And Saddam Hussein will do the same thing Stalin did before him. Purge certain people. If, ever, if you've ever seen that, that footage, I mean, that's, that's it's kind of tragic. When Saddam takes over in 79, and certain and there's certain names being read off, and people are people are pointed to. They they get up and they start blubbering and crying. They know what's going to happen to them at the at this party meeting. They take it outside and they're shot. Yeah, I mean, you might not like it, but isn't that basically what you have to do when you're in a situation like that? Who wants to Who wants to live in a system like that? And again, and again, you're going to see this later on with Stalin. But I mean, but I mean, the, the, this should have been obvious to certain people. Look what he did during the Civil War, burning down villages. I mean, torching whole villages because they wouldn't turn over or not turn over enough food, enough livestock to feed the Red Army. I mean, that kind of tells you right there where they're going, where he's going. Now, I don't believe in parliamentary government. Well, you know where he's going. You know where he's going. And yet he's able to take power here. Fascinating what you've seen develop here. Absolutely fascinating. Wow. Let me come back next week. I'm going to get into Stalin's program of collectivizing the peasant and his program of forced industrialization. And that'll get into the purges of the party and also the purges of the military. Um, and that will carry us right up to like 1939. So it'll be like 1927 to 1939. And how Stalin really takes control of this country. Because Joe Stalin knows one thing. You know, this proletarian revolutionary stuff. That's not what makes you a great power. What makes you a great power is industrializing. You know, Uncle Joe understands that in 1914, when Russia went to war, you know, when, when the Tsar mobilized, 
you know, you're eventually going to mobilize 6 million men here and only 4 million have rifles. Yeah, how's that going to work? You know, Russia is not, is, is, is not on the same page here as the British, the French, and the Germans. They're the least industrialized, least organized, least prepared for war. And Stalin's idea is not on my watch. That's not going to happen. This is where Mr. Stalin is going to go. And the idea here will be, we are, meaning Russia, we are going to do in 25 years what it took America to do in 100. If it costs a lot of lives, eh. I want it done. Yes. Steel. Steel. Yugoshvili. When he begins writing, he actually adopts the name K. Stalin, or Steel. And so that name is going to resonate. Steel. Of course, it sounds, it sounds more powerful when you say Stalin. You know? uh, and in fact, the name, the name resonates with the tact he's going to take with his program of industrialization. Heavy industries, machine tools, tractors, steel. Fascinating how the name kind of is emblematic of where he's going to go with his program of industrialization. But I'll get into that deeper next week. Because again, you're going to see a party backlash to this. Or members of the party who feel that this, gee, this isn't really what Lenin would have wanted. But that's irrelevant. Lenin's dead. I'm here. It's irrelevant. So, yes? What happened to the Mensheviks? Uh, many of them will be absorbed into the Bolshevik party. Some will melt away. Some will be shot. And said, in fact, a number of the Bolsheviks Lenin came up with will be shot. And I'll get into that next week. Yes? Oh, the 1945 war? That had, a, that had an effect on the 195 January 1905, you know, uh, uh, Father Gapon leading the entourage. Uh, one of the reasons, for, you know, Russia, Russia was looking to create that empire in Asia, pursue that empire. And that's, that means they're going to run into competition with the Japanese and the British, because the British don't want them in, in colonial India. And that's one of the reasons the British will forge an alliance with the Japanese in 1902. And uh, the, 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 the Japanese, uh, when the Russians go to war with the Japanese, one, one, it's not only to grab the land, but let's face it, if you can have a war overseas and be successful, you're taking attention away from your problems here at home. And that didn't work too well. So people are not only having problems eating, they want to own land, they don't have a say in their government, now we're losing a war, why do we need you for and so the Tsar will begin that crackdown. Instead of having this constitutional monarchy, which some of these people wanted, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to crack the whip, and he's going to sick the Cossacks on them. But that had a bearing on this war. And so in actuality, in actuality here, the Russian Revolution really didn't start 1917. It started 1905. You know, revolutions have a leader. Revolutions are like a movie, but there's a leader leading up to it. I mean, our revolution started, what, 1775, 1776? But what happened in 1770? What happened in 1765? What happened in 17, 1764? And so on and so forth. So you have this leader leading. You know, revolutions just don't start. There has to be a reason for it. And the 1905 conflict, yeah. And the Japanese will win that war. And that's another aspect of this, because now it shows that Asians can defeat white Christian colonial powers. And that was a big thing in Asia. And that's going to act as a spur later on to people like Sun Yat-sen, Mao Zedong, Ho Chi Minh. Yeah, the white Christian colonial powers aren't invincible. Well, nobody is anyway. So sometimes it takes just one example. Yes? 
Well, yeah, you know, that, that, that what you're asking is interesting because when you go back to the 1930s, uh, info on Stalin's show trials, you know, the, the, the purges of the party, were coming out. But at the same time, if you come to this country, uh, keep in mind this is the era of the, of the Great Depression. And there were many people here who flirted with Marxism, socialism, uh, and what's going to happen to some of them with the McCarthy hearings in the 1950s. And so many of these people who uh, maybe espoused left, the left-wing agenda, many of them gave up communism. That's too late by then, according to the McCarthy hearings. But at the same time here, when there, were, there were a number of people who actually were enamored with Nazi Germany. Well, gee whiz, here is this guy, Hitler, who seems, you know, Germany now is standing up for itself. Uh, you know, people like who? Uh, 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 Prescott Bush? Lim Henry Ford? People like this? The Dulles brothers? And so, but when we go to war with Nazi Germany, uh, sometimes what's the best way to catch a thief is to use a thief. And so, you know, you had, in fact, keep in mind here when you're in this question, when, you know, Stalin and Hitler, well, Hitler was Stalin's connivance, they wiped Poland off the map, there was a danger that Britain and France would have to go to war with Germany and Russia. In fact, at one point, Churchill drew up plans to invade Norway, go across Norway, and infringe on, on, on Swedish neutrality to get into Finland to help the Finns against the Russians. Of course, none of this pans out. It doesn't happen. Maybe, thank God. Because when the war does come, you know, when Hitler invades the Soviet Union, they're going to win the land war. And, it's gonna, and, and, Sta and Churchill's going to say, it's the Soviet army that tore the guts out of the German army. So history turns out the way it does. And I'm going to get into that. So that question of yours is going to be really answered in the next week or two, over the next two weeks. But it's an interesting series of events that occurs here. I mean, and keep in mind, too, at this stage, the 1920s, there are two countries that are not in the League of Nations and maybe should have been in 1919, and that's the United States and the Soviet Union. One, because it didn't want to be, and the second, because it had fallen sway to godless communism. Yet maybe these are the two powers that could have kept the rise of the fascists in line and bolstered the British and the French. But again, that doesn't happen. But that's some of the thought of some historians. And there is some merit to this. There is some merit. Because the British and the French had been blood white in the trenches. And their, bank, and their financial status had been... Had been impacted too by the first world war so yes yeah yeah one of the one of the big differences was trotsky uh, was one of those who, uh, you know, the, the, that revolution needed, needed, be, needed to go on outside of Russia. Stalin believed, uh, so, he came out with socialism at home, you know, uh, which meant he's going to develop the Soviet Union first, or he's going to do that once he takes power. I'll get into that more next week. But one of the things was Trotsky, you know, there's going to be revolution through Europe. This is the way that we can prevent that, that we can protect revolution here at home by having revolution in our neighboring neighboring states, Poland, Germany, England, France, so on and so forth. It didn't work, and so Stalin understood that you know again with you know even with Lenin here that Bela Kun when he took power in Hungary after the First World War, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia developed Marxist governments. They don't last. They're done. They're, out. They're, they're going to be knocked out. So Stalin understood that Europe's not ready for a proletarian revolution, so we need to have socialism here at home. But again, this is the, sequ this, this is, this is the, this is the fascinating part, how Stalin 
goes through this idea of socialism at home. Is he really a communist or is he a state capitalist? And we'll get into that next week. So it's interesting, interesting how people, people, uh, certain people, you know, uh, many, many, histor some historians or political scientists will say, well, Stalin was a Marxist, he was a communist. Yet, in that respect, then, how can he indulge in state capitalism to build the Soviet Union? So is this an example of how people, how people will change their beliefs to get what they want instead of having a st strict doctrinaire approach? Yeah, sure. Sure it is. That's Stalin. Uh, you know, and oh, look, look, look at Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now, my, some of my Democratic friends would like to say, oh, Franklin D. Roosevelt was a liberal. Hogwash. He was a banker. Roosevelt was practical. I'll give you that. He was practical. Eleanor was the liberal. Franklin was a banker. Because what's Franklin going to say in the end? Is he going to say, I saved the American worker? No, I saved capitalism. So, you know, people have to acclimate themselves to a certain situation despite their political beliefs. That's if you want to survive. And again, Lenin is another one. After the Civil War, when the Russian economy was falling apart and he's having a problem even keeping proletarians with his, Bolshe with his Bolshevik movement, ah, the new economic policy. Let's, bring, let's inject capitalism into this. Okay, well, this keeps the people happy. Yet there are going to be some, like maybe Trotsky, who aren't quite on board with this. Stalin was, because Stalin understands he wants to stay, they have to stay in power. So, interesting how, the, how, the, how these people make, make changes along the way to stay in power. And prostitute maybe the agenda to do so, which means what? They're more interested in power than they are the agenda. Uh, it's the personal agenda that matters. Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, keep well, keep in mind too. I mean, you're you're seeing after 1918 this rise in revolutionary nationalism. I mean, what's going on in the Middle East? What's going on in it? Ho Chi Minh, didn't he go to Versailles? What was he told? Forget it. Your country, your, your, your people are going to remain in part of the French colonial system. So now he join, he becomes a communist. Well, this is, this is where the Bolsheviks, though, you know, even though Lenin says we have to have the, pro, the, the, the peasant with the proletariat, they, to modernize, to modernize, you have to urbanize because where are the factories going to go? A lot, a lot of them are going to go near the, near, near, the, near the cities. And what's going to happen? Some of the people are going to leave the farms and where are they going to go? Right, and what's going to happen to some of the cities? They're going to grow, population, right? That's what happened in the Confederacy when they industrialized. Although they kind of waited. The horse was already out the barn door. The north was so far ahead of them. But the fact of the matter is, that's kind of a, uh, you know, what ha what happened in the so what's going to happen in the Soviet Union is kind of what happened in the south during the Civil War, only this is going to be on steroids by comparison. Now, of course, keep in mind, Russia is not at war. The south was, and that's different, despite that commonality. So it's interesting when you take a look at the South and then take a look at the Soviet Union in this respect. Interesting the commonalities you see. Wow. 